I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about narcolepsy and ADHD. As usual, I will start with the take-home message. ADHD and narcolepsy are associated with each other more than you'd expect by random chance. And some people say, aren't these two things opposite? Isn't ADHD about the hyperactive kid bouncing all around the classroom, racing around, not being able to fall asleep, whereas someone with narcolepsy, by definition, is someone who's falling asleep at the drop of the hat. And the real story is that ADHD certainly features troubles maintaining alertness, close to narcolepsy as being a trouble with maintaining awakefulness. And sleep disturbances are present in both. Several genetic analyses have found some genes in common, and there is question as could narcolepsy lead to ADHD? Could ADHD lead to narcolepsy? And an interesting research technique called Mendelian randomization shows that ADHD is not causing narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is not causing ADHD. It's that there are separate genes for a couple of different brain functions, dopamine systems, autoimmune systems, iron metabolism can either lead to the development of ADHD or narcolepsy or both. So I won't describe ADHD in too much detail since this is an ADHD channel and I have numerous videos about that, but ADHD consists of symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and sleep problems are really, really prevalent. They're not part of the diagnosis, but most studies suggest upwards of 80, 90% of people with ADHD have significant problems with sleep, particularly delayed sleep onset at night, particularly irregular or inconsistent hours someone's trying to sleep, and excessive daytime sleepiness is common in ADHD. Most studies find upwards of 50% of people with ADHD are reporting that they are excessively tired and sleepy during the daytime. Common ways this is explained away is that if you have sleep deprivation, if you're going to bed late, if you're sleeping fewer hours, if your sleep is more restless, you're going to be tired during the daytime. That certainly can explain part of it. Another factor explaining excessive daytime sleepiness is that many people with ADHD, when they're bored, when they're not adequately stimulated, fall asleep or become close to falling asleep. So that could be another explanation. And also misperceptions can be part of it. So I've had people talking about how tired and how sleepy and they fall asleep at the drop of a hat and they're always sleepy, they're always tired, and they're talking a mile a minute and walking around the room when they're doing it and displaying from an external viewpoint extreme hyperactivity and activity levels, whereas their own report is that they're sleepy. Again, some of it might be that they're active and engaged when they're interacting with people or on a task, and then when that stimulation is gone, they crash. Many studies indicate that part of what's going on in the brain wiring of ADHD is an excessive number of connections, interactions, and an inability to inhibit or shut down pathways that don't need to be activated, which means that the brain may well be consuming much more energy and there may be real fatigue reasons that someone with ADHD who tackles the same task with a more inefficient network is going to be more fatigued or tired from it. And again, there are differences. I have a video on fatigue between sleepiness and tiredness. So jumping over to narcolepsy, central defining symptom of narcolepsy is excessive daytime sleepiness. So that's required part of having it. In addition though, it's not just excessive daytime sleepiness. Most people with narcolepsy have significant disruptions of sleep when they try to sleep at night and particularly disruptions of the REM sleep and the sleep architecture of how the different states of sleep play out relative to each other. And in narcolepsy, the prevailing picture is that REM sleep shows up immediately when someone's going to sleep. That's not usually what happens in people without narcolepsy. And that's part of the explanation for some of the other symptoms of narcolepsy, one of which gets the fun name of hypnogogic hallucinations. Hypno is sleep. Gago is going. You can remember it by G-O going to sleep. People with narcolepsy are also more prone to having hypnopompic hallucinations. Pompic is your popping out of sleep. Also associated with that, you can have it or you cannot have it. It doesn't, it isn't an essential part. 
is sleep paralysis. So normally during REM sleep, our brains are quite active, but our body is paralyzed. Sleep paralysis is a strange name because it's actually paralysis. Once you are awake, your body is still displaying part of REM sleep in terms of your body being paralyzed, but you're awake, you're not still sleeping. That can be a very scary, disturbing symptom. Usually it only lasts for a few seconds to a few minutes, but that's again a part of different aspects of sleep are not showing their normal relationship to each other. Other significant symptom of narcolepsy is cataplexy, and that's a sudden loss of muscle tone, usually with something exciting, something or with emotional, strong emotions. So it can be excitement, joy, it can be fear, it can be anger, someone's really angry, and then they just collapse to the ground because they've lost all muscle tone. And again, that seems to reflect disturbances of what normally might be happening during stages of sleep and paralysis, but not normal waking tone. So creatively, narcolepsy is divided into two types, and each of these types probably contains subtypes within it, but type one, creatively called type one, cataplexy is a part of it, again, excessive fatigue during the day, disturbed sleep at night, and in type one, there is destruction of the orexin cells in the lateral hypothalamus, so orexin is a neurotransmitter that's intimately involved with arousal wakefulness. We have some sleep agents, dual orexin receptor antagonists, the DORA agents, like Belsamra and Davidjo. I have a video on that. We also have some drugs like Provigil, Nuvigil, Modafinil, and Armodafinil, which are orexin activating drugs. And confusingly, orexin has another name, hypocretin. These are two names for the exact same molecule. This molecule was discovered in completely separate labs that were studying different aspects of sleep, and it took months to a few years before they realized they were working with the exact same polypeptide neurotransmitter. Also creatively named type 2 of narcolepsy, normal levels of orexin are found there. So in type 1, it seems most of the cases are an autoimmune process attacking the orexin making cells in the lateral hypothalamus and in some cases almost completely obliterating or destroying all of those cells. In type 2 narcolepsy, orexin levels are normal. Usually cataplexy is not present. In rare cases, narcolepsy can be caused by head trauma. There do seem to be genetic predispositions for it, but we don't know exactly how it is caused. Most often it shows up between ages 15 to 35. There are some people who do develop it earlier, some who do develop it later in life, and usually once it's there, it continues as a lifelong condition. Non-medication treatments include good sleep hygiene, trying to regular, regularize the circadian clock, good sleep-wake cycle, using exercise and diet to help reinforce that. For many people with narcolepsy, those are only partially helpful. FDA-approved drugs include modafinil, which is provigil, and armodafinil, which is the right-handed stereoisomer of that same molecule, marketed as nuvigil. And a few years ago, a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor, brand name Sinosi, generic name Solriamfetol, was approved. That's also effective in narcolepsy, probably also effective in ADHD, as higher modafinil and armodafinil. So for years before there was any approved drugs, and even after the approval of these agents specifically for narcolepsy, methylphenidate, Ritalin products, and amphetamine products, Adderall and Vyvanse like products, are commonly still used to treat narcolepsy. Again, they do have the same risks of potential for addiction, cardiac side effects, and psychosis that they have in ADHD, but they work for many people, and, and some people they do work more powerfully than those non-stimulant options for narcolepsy. So in terms of the relationship between narcolepsy and ADHD, so to, to ground this and put it in perspective, most studies indicate that fewer than a tenth of a percent of individuals have narcolepsy. There's a lot of variability country to country. Japan and some other East Asian countries seem to have considerably higher rates. It's also thought that somewhere between 
a quarter to half of the cases of narcolepsy are never properly identified or diagnosed, so the rates may be on the low side. Most studies suggest fewer than a tenth of a percent of people have full-blown narcolepsy. Again, with ADHD, it's probably in the range in childhood of maybe 5 to 10 percent in adults and the 4 to 6 percent of adults. In the ADHD population, if you have ADHD, studies indicate anywhere from 5 to 30 percent of those people with ADHD do have narcolepsy. And again, it depends on how rigorously it's defined, but that's much higher than you would expect just by random chance. And the converse picture, anywhere from a quarter to a third of those people with it have ADHD, again, much higher than you would expect by random chance. So these things are clearly associated, and polygenic studies have indicated there are genes these have in common. Genetic research and epidemiologic research indicates that it's not just ADHD that narcolepsy is associated with. There's a fairly strong association with schizophrenia and a strongly fairly strong association with depression as well. Study design called Mendelian randomization, which can help us detect cause and effect relationships, not just associations, actually indicate that narcolepsy can be a contributing cause to schizophrenia. Doesn't work the other way, so schizophrenia doesn't cause narcolepsy. Interestingly though, depression seems to have some causative role in some people's narcolepsy. Doesn't work the other way though. Narcolepsy is not causing depression. In terms of the relationship between ADHD and narcolepsy, it's causative in neither direction. So ADHD is not causing anyone to develop narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is not causing anyone to develop ADHD. And again, studies from using genome-wide analysis and developing polygenic risk scores have shown that both the inattentive and hyperactive symptoms of ADHD are associated or more often in conjunction with narcolepsy than you'd expect by chance. Looking at it the other way, the excessive daytime sleepiness of narcolepsy is not linked to ADHD. Several different studies have indicated that there's a set of several different types of genes which are contributing both to the likelihood of developing narcolepsy and to the likelihood of developing ADHD. So it's not, again, narcolepsy and ADHD causing each other. It's that things like Dopamine signaling can lead to either one of these conditions. Problems with interleukin-6 and other cytokines and parts of the immune system, particularly related to autoimmune diseases, can contribute to either of these conditions. Problems with iron metabolism, and iron metabolism in the brain is particularly linked to dopamine systems and potential damage to dopamine systems. So that's, again, genes there are linked to both narcolepsy and ADHD. And genes that are regulating glial cell function, so glial cells are the support cells in the brain, non-neurons there seem to increase the risk for either ADHD or narcolepsy. Again, there's overlap between these conditions. If you have one of these conditions, you should sort of be on the lookout for the other. And of course, as in anything with mental health diagnosis, it's hard to know how often, but at least occasionally, one of these conditions can be falsely ascribed when it's the other one that is present. So some people who have narcolepsy don't have it recognized in the setting of ADHD, or they don't even have ADHD, they only have narcolepsy, but it's misdiagnosed. And the other way around can happen as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about Mendelian randomization just because it's an incredibly powerful technique. It's becoming, it's being used much more often now that we have numerous, very large databases where everyone's genome, their whole genetic map has been plotted or recorded or, or enough of it to make inferences about multiple genes. So the amlodipine, whether that has a beneficial effect for ADHD video that relied at least in part on a Mendelian randomization study. Again, the study here, it's not just an association, but it's not a causative one. So in Mendelian randomization study, there's three main components. One component is the exposure, so that could be the medication, the trait, the condition you're looking at to see whether it results in your outcome measure. So you have exposure and outcome, and then we have a constructed measure called a genetic instrument. The genetic instrument alleles the versions of genes that are really strongly associated with the exposure, whether narcolepsy causes 
ADHD. Narcolepsy in this case would be our exposure. ADHD would be the outcome we're looking at. And the genetic instrument would be the genes that are really strongly, the term they use in the field is relevant to narcolepsy. And then the final step of the Mendelian randomization is to look at how well that genetic instrument correlates with the outcome. So are those genes that are associated with narcolepsy also involved specifically with the outcome? And again, some of the strength of this approach, in some ways it's nature's replication of a randomized controlled study because when you inherit genes from your parents, you get a version of each gene from each parent. We'll throw out the sex chromosome linked genes in men because men get just one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Otherwise, you have two chromosomes, two copies of each gene. So your parents each have two copies of each gene. Which of those two they're sending to you is a randomized mix and match event during meiosis when the sex cells are splitting and creating the egg and the sperm that are going to join and form an individual. So it's randomized and the genes are not assorted with each other. So it's randomization at each point on the genome with no connection or correlation what's happening at gene one to gene two to gene three. The Mendelian randomization approach can be really powerful at ruling out reverse causality because it's not possible that if your outcome again is looking at whether it has ADHD or not, the ADHD certainly did not go backwards in time and change the person's genes that were associated with narcolepsy. The approach can also rule out many confounding environmental variables because what was going on in the individual's environment did not determine which genes they inherited. Again, we're not talking about epigenetics in which genes are activated. This is looking at just what the genes they inherited. So it can be a powerful technique, again, not just identifying associations, but identifying causality and again, ruling out some of the common confounding errors and reverse causality that are common with just epidemiologic association studies. Hopefully that was clear enough. Um, if not, I might do a whole video on Mendelian randomization, but that's all for narcolepsy and ADHD. Stay healthy and happy.